I am happy to be with you today. And what I'd like to share with you is the work that we do in Roots of Empathy. The nub of it is we're in the same vineyard because Roots of Empathy works in classrooms, in schools, in 10 countries, in many languages, and it all comes down to the community of the classroom is where you can see significant change. And teachers matter. Schools matter. And my, my sense of life is that the family is the most important institution. It's overlooked. It's uh, very often criticized. It's not perfect, but it's where we all start. And, you know, home is known as where the heart is, but not known for where the real start is. And all the work that you're doing related to attachment, it all starts there and blossoms or goes off the track. And when it goes off the track, everybody in a 10-mile radius and beyond is very much impacted by it. So um, my hat's off to you for taking on the important work of um, helping children and their families to have happy and productive lives. And you mentioned the, the Dalai Lama. Um, we've had several dialogues. Empathy up, aggression down. Up, down. So what he was doing, because he's very focused on the impact of research. He's very focused on brain-based research and neuroscience. That um, he wants to understand humanity through the lens of the brain. And very often surrounds himself with neuroscientists. And then sometimes me to make sense of the neuroscience and the social science and the science of humanity. So um, I'd just like to say that the attachment relationship is the core of the Roots of Empathy program, and you will not hear it discussed in that way. You will usually hear Roots of Empathy discussed as a classroom program which reduces bullying and reduces aggression and builds um, social and emotional learning. Your government, many years ago, asked me to bring the program big time as a social emotional learning program. And at that stage of our evolution, I wasn't ready to do it. Uh, we have a very big commitment to scale without losing integrity. And because we work through relationships, um, you can't bite off more than you can chew. At that time, I didn't feel that we could make a big commitment. And now we're throughout the UK. But to everything there is a season. And just like you can't rush a child's development, just like in schools we understand, children have different, um, different strategies and stages of development. And we respect the fact that not every child is gonna learn to read on the last week of school in, in kindergarten. We don't expect children to walk at the same time or to talk at the same time. We're aware of the developmental stages, but respect the unique development of the child. Yet in life, it doesn't always sort out like that. The expectations on families to be responsive to their babies and to know how to raise their young children, it's as if it's a given. And the work that I did before um, creating Roots of Empathy in 1996 was um, an, an innovation I started in 1981 that was school-based. Everything I do is school-based because I think that's where the real power is. In developed countries, every child goes to school. In developed countries, I think our boards of education and our departments of education are really departments or ministries of peace. It's where every child is treated equally. It's where it doesn't matter what, you, what street you live on, where you come from. You come into a classroom and you're treated equally and equitably. Doesn't happen anywhere else in life. So I think schools are very powerful places for building democracy, very powerful places for particularly your 
all we've been hearing about today, um, the way children can be treated, the way we can understand our relationship with children is pretty powerful stuff. So my first um, innovation was uh, parenting and family literacy centers going back to 81. And the idea was to support parents when they were pregnant, when they had babies, and right up to the time that children started school. So that parents who were not accustomed to interfacing with the school, who maybe didn't have a brilliant academic record, who maybe had babies very young, who for whatever reason didn't feel mainstream and didn't feel that they even had the language of access for the school. So these marginalized families who were not targeted, uh, this was a universal program, it was an invitation. Uh, these were the families who wouldn't come to any interview. These were the families who didn't have a voice. Not that the schools didn't want them to have a voice, but they didn't have a voice. Um, so it was about turning the tables on how families could participate in their children's education um, and giving them the supports that they identified. And for those of you in social work, you'll appreciate how the tables have turned on how we think about helping people. In those old days, we, the overall thinking, and maybe you were ahead of North America here, but the overall thinking was, we'll fix them up and we'll make them just like us and won't that be dandy? And it was incredibly patronizing. So the work that we did was to meet people on the street and in the laundromat and in the gymnasium, and I don't mean the workout gymnasium, I mean the community center, so that you met people on equal footing and you asked how you could help rather than identifying what their deficits were. And when you come from that kind of approach like you do in schools, people feel comfortable to engage with you. And it was through that work um, that I really saw deeply into the incredible challenges of domestic violence, child abuse, and neglect. These programs grew in an amazingly quick way, um, so much so that they became public policy. Reason they became public policy? When you do um, an early development indicator, which is a, a more or less a measure of how children entering school, how prepared they are on five domains of development. The schools where we were working, the children were in the lowest 10th percentile. So the research that was done looked at these children who'd come through the parenting and family literacy centers and found that they were in the 50th plus percentile, whereas their little neighbors who didn't come were in the lowest 10th and unfortunately, how we start school is very often how we finish, unless you have brilliant interventions like we've been hearing about today. So the whole programs were predicated on helping parents know how to help their children. So it was the power of the parent. In one case, I, I just had a stop in, in Lisbon um, yesterday, and uh, where I come from, um, in Newfoundland, which is the eastern coast of Canada, the Portuguese fishermen used to come in and the fleet would come and I remember my mother saying, okay, we're going down to the harbor front. And it didn't matter what you were doing, the fleet was in. You go and you see the wonderful boats, the sun is shining, let's go, leave everything else behind. The, here's something exciting. And then in Toronto, working with a community of um, people who had come from the Azores and settled in Toronto in a tight community. And uh, they came with the whole family because family is central. And the grandmothers were raising the grandchildren. And so you would have in the parenting and family literacy center in that neighborhood, Portuguese grannies completely dressed in black with <coughs> up to five or six toddlers in tow and raising those children. And those grannies didn't uh, read in Portuguese. They had a grade three education from the Azores. Very, very hard working. Their values in raising children, feed them well. That's how you show them you love them. Dress them well. These children were sparkling clean. Uh, but these children were not spoken to so much, uh, were not played with so much, were not read to because the grands didn't know how to read so well, and were not allowed to get dirty because they were out <coughs> in public. 
So the very interesting thing with those two bits of information, to go to Lisbon and see where they, and, and Portugal, and see where all these folks had come from in the very different world that children inhabit today compared to those old days. And what happened, I shared the story with those Portuguese grannies. In the center that they came to, we set up an afternoon class with a teacher to teach them how to read Dick Bruna books in Portuguese so that they could be able to read good night stories to the grandchildren. Do you know that those grandchildren who were the lowest ranking of all the categories in the Toronto school system, they came up plus 52 wow. because of love, because of the commitment of those grandmothers. The parents were busy doing two and three jobs each. You know, they say in Toronto that it's, it's Portuguese mothers clean all the buildings and the banks. And I tell you, the grannies clean everything else. So you look at finding ways to leverage love, to leverage learning, to leverage voice. Because in a, a culture where the voice of the child is not necessarily thought of as being important, that can change. And uh, so the learnings from all the various groups um, that we worked with in the Parenting and Family Literacy Centers really informed Roots of Empathy. So we worked with thousands of families. And of course, you look at the statistics for child abuse, neglect, and domestic violence, it cuts across all domains. It cuts across <coughs> culture, language, religion, socioeconomic status. It's all of us. But you get to see it. When people trust you, they share their pain. So I was unprepared and horrified for the suffering within families. And of course, what I learned was it was a generational transformation tra you know, of, of pain. That um, parenting was painful for people who were not parented uh, with unconditional love, who did not have the type of attachment that was positive who didn't know another way to raise their children. And not that there's any one right way to love and there's no one right way to parent. Love takes all kinds of shades, but a baby knows when they're loved. And if they're not predictably and consistently loved, they have problems. And of course, that baby grows up to parent in the same way that they were parented. So in all the violence, what was crashingly clear to me it was the common denominator of the absence of empathy. There were no monsters here. You know, I worked with people who actually did kill their children, uh, people who had no emotion regulation whatsoever, people who had no capacity to understand how others felt and virtually zero to feel with them. And it wasn't their fault. So there was no naming or blaming or shaming. There was a learning. And my aha in those old days was that the missing piece was empathy and that I believed before the scientists were confirming way back when that we were all born predisposed for empathy. We're born for love is what we're born for. I mean, when you think of the triumphs of civilization, the arts and the sciences and recently technology, the thing really that we do best is love. But we don't talk about it. It's the most exquisitely human thing that we do. And just to be born human does not guarantee our humanity. It takes empathy to be humane. And realizing that empathy was the missing thing, I also saw in all of this suffering and all of the beautiful parent-child interactions that if we're predisposed to empathy, the first relationship or the attachment relationship, even if it's one person that's good to go, we know that. One person who's crazy about a child will do it. If you have the bonus of two people who lay down their lives for a child, I mean, that's, that's a home run. And then if you've got a big extended family and you've got a community that cares, how can you go wrong? So. I put all my eggs in the basket that we need to hold 
the mother and the baby in the palm of our hands. We need to nurture, we need to celebrate, we need to learn from that. So if you want to break cycles of intergenerational violence and poor parenting, we have got to show little children what love looks like. And the best example of empathy and love you can find is that early relationship. We work with mothers and fathers. We also work with any definition of family, as long as it is the key person. And in some of our Aboriginal cultures in Canada, the first baby is brought up by the grandmother, the mother of the mother. That's the norm. It's not that the mother can't do it. They're obviously in the same community. But the baby is given over because it's perceived the mother isn't yet mature enough to raise the baby. So, I mean, that's very offensive to a lot of people, but I bow to culture every time. Who are we to judge? We don't even know our own culture because we're in it too deep. So, uh, if it works for other people, even if it doesn't work for them, who are we to say? So, we take our hat off to culture and work with the culture. But, um, so, Roots of Empathy, my decision was that we would bring the attachment relationship to school. And we would set out a green blanket, and little children would sit around the green blanket. We'd train the people that I had worked with for decades in the parenting and family literacy centers, who had a profound respect for family, who made no judgments. Any job we hire, if the person has any whiff of judgment, they don't get past the first sentence. So it's not necessarily about how much we've learned. It's about how much wisdom we hold and about how much humility we have. So if you need to be putting yourself at the center of every conversation, you don't fit into our organization. And we won't have you in a classroom with children. So um, with Roots of Empathy, my hope was that children who are not fooled by the thicket of words that we are as adults, that they have very clear vision for truth, they have very clear vision for authenticity, and you can't fool them by saying, I really do care how you feel and I really do like you when you don't because they know you're lying. Their emotional truth is pure. So in trying this out, um, which I did undercover and illegally uh, <laughs> with two schools, in fact, I've done many legal things in my life, but uh, <laughs> I've been kicked out of three hospitals. The reason I've been kicked out of three hospitals is when I was working with teenage mothers and they had a baby has to be celebrated. So if you're a young woman who's duly addicted to crack cocaine and alcohol, and you've been smoking since you're 11, and the first thing you do that's exquisitely yours is have a baby, and everyone says, well, she's too young, and what, she got business having a baby. So we would take all the teenage mothers and descend on the hospital, and I'd go first with my credentials and we'd sneak them in one after the other, after the other, till the room was full. The only rule was no smoking. They weren't allowed to smoke in the hospital. But they got up to other mischief, as you can appreciate, and the presents they bought were very interesting. So I have been escorted out of many hospitals. But I'm proud, because we, every baby's birth is the birth of hope. And who are we to say? when the right time is to have a baby. And working as much as we do with Aboriginal communities, whether it's in Canada or the Maori and Pacific Island families in New Zealand or in the US, the indigenous peoples of the world have a shared view, world view, of babies. It's so interesting. Every baby is the gift of the creator. Now, we all have different creators. But to believe that a baby is a gift is where we come from in Roots of Empathy. No judgments, but here is this precious child. What can we learn from this child? And we teach through relationships. But this is our little teacher, the Roots of Empathy baby. And the baby and the mother, the children think it's not about the mother at all, that it's about the, the baby. But when the baby um, is the center of attention, the children are coached by the Roots of Empathy instructor who's had a very intense training and has a very heavy, complex curriculum because of all the 27 classes that are had during the year, they're 
our aims and activities, and there is no activity that is done unless there's a clear reason for doing it. How dare we waste one minute of time in a classroom if we don't know why we're you know, doing what we're doing? So there's a very clear accountability for all of that. But the focus is really on the baby's development. What is the baby's intention? How are we understanding what this little baby is doing? So perspective taking is a cognitive aspect of empathy. We're trying to raise levels of empathy in the children. And the other affective aspect of empathy is emotion. So I very, feel very connected to you folks who are working with emotion. So we teach emotional literacy through experiential learning. So the experience um, is very close that the children are breathing in the relationship. We sing the baby around the circle. The little baby is presented by the parent to each child. Three seconds a child. We have the parent count because they'll whiz through. Three seconds. The idea is every child gets to cuddle the baby's legs or feet. We ask that they don't do the face or hands because even though they wash their hands before the baby comes, they do the allergic salute. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't count on it. Um, but the children sing the whole while. They sing the baby in. And then they connect. And when a little baby, and these babies start the year between two and four months of age. So the children watch the whole year go by. The first year of life is the most dangerous year in every culture on the planet. And it's not just dangerous because of disease. It's dangerous because babies are so vulnerable. And when they cry, parents who haven't been parented well, parents who don't have emotional regulation, parents very often hurt the babies. You know, the number of babies I've worked with who have been shaken to death, shaken into blindness, into paralysis, have cranial bleeds which create all kinds of cascades of learning disabilities. Anyhow, every child has a, a connection with the baby. And when a baby's looked in your eyes, you're changed. So now we know that levels of oxytocin go up, that it's not just about being in the presence of a baby because most of the children have a baby at home. It's the intentional, focused on looking at the whole baby. Who is this little person? And the acknowledgement that is, this is a person. So one of the first things we do in the Roots of Empathy class is we ask the parent to put the baby down in front of the Roots of Empathy instructor. So the instructor says to the baby, may I lift you up? And the children look at you, and they think, that poor, stupid woman. <laughs> you know, does she think that baby's going to answer? So we wait. And you know, I've taken a chapter from many of the Aboriginal people with whom we've had the privilege of working. They don't fill every available moment with noise. You know how it's like the radio. They hate to have dead space. We rush to fill everything with superlatives. and Anyhow, so we just wait. And then finally, some child will say, Miss, the baby doesn't know how to talk yet. <laughs> so, oh, but I wonder, can the baby communicate with us? So then you start from the very first minute talking about what is communication. Because we know talking is not much of the communication. It's about the other ways we show how we truly feel. Because our words really are tricks very often. But how you really feel, it's, it's hard to disguise. So the children are learning, where is the baby looking? Because the first way a baby can say, get out of my face, you strange lady, is to look away. They can't even roll over. They're not able to coordinate their hands to push you away. They can cry, or they can try to get you to go away by looking away. And what is the baby's body like? Is it floppy? Or is it rigid like a board? You know when you try to put babies in a car seat and they don't want to? <laughs> are their hands open or are they fists? What are the baby's eyebrows looking like? So basically we are teaching children to read the emotional cues of an infant. It threatens nobody. The vulnerability of that baby, the exquisite humanity, we are at our most human. 
when we are babies. We enter and leave the world exquisitely human because we're vulnerable at both stages. There's not a child who doesn't fall in love with that baby. And you know, the foster children, they fall in love with the mother. So that the little ones who haven't had a consistent, loving person in their lives just adore the way the mother or the daddy pays attention and gives affection to the baby. And when the children do pictures, the little children who can't write yet, when they evaluate their experience with Roots of Empathy, because you know what? The children evaluate Roots of Empathy. Now we have the white coat, peer-reviewed, published research up the yin-yang. <laughs> but the best indicator of how you're doing is the children. So we tell them you don't have to put your name to it, but you do have to share. It's like voting, right? You say it's your responsibility to let people know about what your experience was. Nobody's going to know it was you, but you can tell the truth because then it will help us know what we might be changing. And you know what? I've changed curriculum because of children. We're always changing our curriculum, and it's usually because of the children. So the little children will draw a picture of their favorite moment in Roots of Empathy. And the little ones for whom life is lonely at home because they don't have a close relationship, they're the ones who say, when the mommy hugs the baby, when the mommy kisses the baby, when the mommy tickles the baby. It's all about this. We had a little seven-year-old boy recently follow the mommy and the baby outside. And the mom down the corridor, the school, and the mom um, well, had just put the baby in the stroller and she turned around and said to the little boy, did you want to tell me something? He said, no, I wanted to ask you something. And she said, yes. He says, where does love come from? So children know. They know when they're in the presence of love. And just because they didn't experience love, birth is not destiny. Schools, social workers, doctors, all of you in the mix are doing all that you can to help children feel that they're there, that they count, that they can feel and feel back. And the, the story that I shared this morning with um, someone who was interviewing me about this, I'll share with you because it's related to this other story. It goes back to the late 90s. And we had Roots of Empathy in a grade 7 class. Now, the education system here, by grade 7, your children are in high school. But this was still elementary school. It's like the highest you can go in elementary school. And there was a little boy who had been in foster care. And when he was four years old, his mother was murdered in front of his eyes. Everyone he knew was in jail. So he didn't have any family. And he was put in foster care. And because children wear their pain in their behavior, it's the only way they know how to say that they're in pain. He was a very difficult, aggressive child. And he kept getting shunted from one family to another family because the poor parents could not manage his misbehavior. So by the time he got to grade 7, if you asked him how many foster care homes he would be, I don't have enough fingers, is the answer. So he literally lost count. So he couldn't believe that he had roots of empathy. And he had, for self-defense, he had shaved his head. Now this is not, now it's very cool to shave your head. It wasn't fashionable in those days. So he'd shaved his head and he had a ponytail at the top, beyond ridiculous, and a, a tattoo <laughs> behind that and he dressed in a way that made him look very aggressive. So the one day, the mom uh, and the Roots of Empathy instructor were discussing the temperament traits of the baby. We teach a lot about temperament in Roots of Empathy, and um, simply because it's a way to understand how we're all different without talking about culture or race or religion. It's something inherent in all of us, is how we see the world is unique along nine different temperament traits. So the mommy was saying that um, she had hoped for a baby that would be very cuddly, you know, the kind you can dress up and show off. And 
So who did she get but a really independent baby? And we always say, you know, you don't get the baby you ordered. You get the baby you get. And that their way of seeing the world is not any credit to the parent if you have a very, um, a baby with high rhythmicity who gets into schedules very easily and sleeps well. Everyone says, oh, what a good baby, meaning what a good parent, and you have the baby that doesn't, and that's the rest of us. <laughs> meaning your incompetent mess, <laughs> who, you know. So um, the, the whole idea of this little baby, and the mother was so honest. She said, well, when I put my baby in the snuggly, now do you know the term snuggly, or what do you call it? You put the baby in the sling. But they're sideways, aren't they? No, OK. Anyhow, she said the baby insists on facing out. Instead of cuddling, which is what she wanted, was a cuddle. And um, so the bell rang. And the mother said, would anybody like to try on the snuggly? And in those days, so Velcro wasn't invented. That's how long ago it was. There were straps this way, that way, and the other way. Anyway, our friend put up his hand. The mother was surprised. The teacher was delighted because the teacher knew the story. And the Roots of Empathy instructor doesn't know the story because it's not our business to know the story. All the children are the one. We don't know that the dog ate the homework, and we don't want to know because you get to reinvent yourself in Roots of Empathy because nobody knows your history. And you show your, your best foot forward all the time. Anyhow, so young fella put on a snuggly, and then the Roots of Empathy instructor said, would you like to put the baby in the snuggly? So the mother looked mildly horrified. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he uh, put the baby in ever so tenderly, chest to chest. Do you know that wise baby cuddled and snuggled and molded into that young boy? So then the young boy, the children were putting on their backpacks. It was very noisy. They're big kids, and they're going out for lunch. And the young fella went off into the corner, and he does this, you know how mothers do this seasick rocking? <laughs> he watched, he did it. So he was doing this seasick rocking with the little baby in the stroll, and he came back, and of course the mother's eyes never broke glance. <laughs> and uh, anyway, he came back, and he very tenderly gave the baby back to the mother, and he said to the Roots of Empathy instructor, do you think that if no one has ever loved you, that you could still be a good father. So no one had words to answer. Did he not strike through to the heart of what it is to be a person? Are you a person if you're not loved, is what he's saying. So he had decided that he would never be a father, initially, because he didn't know how to love. And he felt that possibly he could love. So, you know, we don't really have the right to give up on any child, regardless of what behaviors they show you, because they've been through the war. You know, we talk about um, the stress that our soldiers come back from duty. There are children living in war zones under our noses. They have post-traumatic stress in your classrooms. Do we wonder why there's the cutting that's going on? Children cutting themselves because the physical pain deadens the emotional pain. So I think, you know, we have to be so careful not to let our technologies eclipse our humanity that you fight for the work you're doing. You fight for the right to children's emotional health. You fight for the right for children to have a childhood. The landscape of childhood has changed dramatically. But the essence of a child's emotional life has not changed an iota. Children still have the same irreducible needs. They need love megadoses of love, and they need to be seen and heard. They need to have a sense of voice, which is what we work on hugely in Roots of Empathy. And the way we get to voice, because children who haven't been listened to or have been criticized when they do speak or have a history of failure, whether it's academic or social or emotional failure, 
These are the children who don't risk. And you know, in classrooms, um, you have children who I refer to as dandelions. This is not my analogy, but I, I love it, and I don't actually know who to attribute it to. But if you think of children as dandelions, they will thrive in any classroom setting. These are children who make easy transitions, another temperament trait. These are children who have had secure attachments. Good morning. These are children who feel competent emotionally to deal with change, to be able to handle themselves in new situations. And then you have the orchids. And the orchids need very special care. And it's not that they have been living in violent homes necessarily, or that they, some might not have very secure attachment relationships, but some of them might have real difficulty with transitions. Some of them have uh, extreme shyness. So the children who don't adapt to change as readily are the ones who we really need to see have risk-free learning. And the whole approach to Roots of Empathy is risk-free learning. And that really means that you set up a dynamic in the Roots of Empathy classes where every child feels that if they want to say something, to add something to a conversation or to ask a question, that they feel comfortable to do that. And you know, it's not that teachers are critical, it's that children are critical of other children. And you can't legislate kindness. I mean, every teacher, just like every parent, wants to say, now play nice, share, um, but you can't dictate it. So, but if children believe and understand how other children feel, which is what happens with empathy, it's a break against hurting them. Suddenly, the, the environment in the classroom, the climate, tips. It's usually after Christmas, teachers tell us, they notice, that you see a difference in the dynamic so that we come from a principle of intrinsic motivation and intrinsic pride. So in the training of Roots of Empathy, the four-day training, the most challenging piece for all of our people is to learn not to praise children. Now that sounds like a horrible thing to be saying, but you can praise your heart out at home. But when you're in a group setting, praise is toxic. It's like only one winner and everyone else is a loser. For instance, if someone said, oh, look how tall Mary's standing, isn't she great? Because we're manipulating the other children by using poor Mary as a scapegoat because we want the behavior that uh, Mary is demonstrating. So what happens in the classroom, number one, everyone hates Mary. You know, who does she think she is? Like always, a teacher's pet and all that. They hate Mary, and they're looking for a way to get the light that Mary just had. So they're not paying attention to what's, they're waiting for an opportunity to shine. Just like in conversation, you can smell it two minutes into a conversation. Are you having a real conversation, or is the other person waiting for you to shut up so they can impress you with what they're going to say? That's not a conversation. Those are the situations that I'm old enough and long enough in the tooth to just walk. Life is short, you know. So meaningful conversations, which are the only conversations that children have, by the way, when they're, you know, comfortable. So when you stop praising in a group, suddenly voices come out that you've never heard before. And the reason we don't have teachers teach roots of empathy, we want them to see this. You know, the, the pressures on teachers just mount every year. The number of hats they have to wear, you could fit in no cupboard. It just gets, the more complex life gets for children, the harder the job of teaching becomes. And now, of course, we're becoming more and more administrative and, and legal, and it, it's a very complex job. So we want teachers to have the chance to be part of something and not have to be running it. To be able to sit around the blanket with their children and observe their children observing the baby, see their children being magnificent, because the children are magnificent. When we put them in a situation 
where they can observe and then share what they're thinking and feeling. Because in school as teachers, I'm a former teacher, we're responsible for what children know. In Roots of Empathy, we're responsible for what children are thinking and what they're feeling. Every teacher would love to have that. That would be a privilege. But thank you. You've got all this accountability. So teachers love that there's a chance to really look at the social and emotional lives of their students and to be part of that. And of course, teachers are brilliant the way they make um, all sorts of activities to follow up on the child who is failing terribly, if you find an interest that child has, teachers leap on that. And so we have all kinds of stories we hear from teachers about how they have an entire math program based on what's the best way to diaper a baby. Because that is one of the, the activities we have, which is a consensus building activity. Because we have <coughs> quietly, without talking about it, and the children wouldn't know what it's all about anyway, uh, we're concerned about executive function skills. We're concerned that children learn how to make good decisions. You know, it's not fair for the high school teachers that the child arrives and suddenly they're grading the child on their organizational capacities and their, their ability to coordinate everything else. That starts preschool. Children don't start dropping out of high school in high school. They start dropping out in preschool. So teachers along the way have huge capacities to be able to help children organize their lives. Thinking and feeling are inextricably linked. You cannot teach a child or the child cannot learn when they're sad, sick, or lonely. They just can't. And we have a pandemic of loneliness. It's not just here, it's everywhere. And that's part of the landscape of childhood, that children are feeling alienated at home as well as in public spaces that there's not as much time for play. And we heard this morning about play. Play is a child's natural healing. Play is a child's natural learning. You watch a baby, how do they discover everything? But the big thing they have to discover is the freedom to learn through play. And children need permission. And we need to understand that play is about meaning making as well and forming relationships and the knob of everything that is important in life comes down to relationships. And it's like the real estate agent say, location, location, location. Relationship, relationship, relationship. So I want to show you a very short clip um, of a, a regular class. I'm not sure exactly what age the children are, but it's just to share with you how we teach. What we do is we reach, because we don't tell the children anything, really. We just ask experiential questions about what they're seeing. There are actually no right answers. We have no idea how the baby really feels. The mother is probably the best guess, but we really don't know. But we want children to make informed guesses, take risks, have voice have themselves taken seriously. So every time a child says something in Roots of Empathy, the instructor says, thank you. Sounds like you're going to a shrink session, eh? Uh, no judgment. Um, or they repeat what the child said, which is the highest compliment. It might be completely absurd. Like the pre-family visit before the family comes, the very first one in every class, Here's how the classroom teacher helps. We say to the children, now here's a picture of the baby that's going to be your baby. So what do you think this baby is going to be like? And what will the baby be able to do? So the little wee children say, play soccer. Or, you know, outrageous things um, that are not realistic at all. And the older children are pretty realistic about what might happen. And we say, and, and what size do you think the baby will be? And we have a Roots of Empathy doll that's about yay big. And we say, well, do you think the baby's going to be the same size as the doll, smaller or bigger? And we're going to vote on this. Why? Participatory democracy. We want children to be voters r early, early, early. We see the classroom as a participatory democracy. I told you I see it's the Ministry of Peace. So engagement. So how do you take a chance? So 
they vote looking around, because it's a first class, what's so-and-so voting, and instead of just guessing. So anyhow, then when the baby comes, we get the doll out and we measure up the baby. And in most cases, children are thinking, oh, I guessed right, I guessed right. We're not interested in guessing right. We're saying, wow, isn't that interesting? This many of us thought this size, the baby tricked us. The baby's this size. So you are eliminating the comparison and the competition that is a normal part of life. And I'm not anti-competition by any means. I'm just saying if we want all children to feel that they can contribute and they can be taken seriously and listened to, we have to provide the conditions for them to experience that. We all say, you know, we encourage children to speak up, just like we encourage them to have the behavior, take your elbows off the table and wipe your mouth and all those kinds of things. But it's when they really see it happening that they believe it. So um, the children really do have a chiseled sense that what they have to say is worthwhile. So then the baby comes and we do the measuring. And when we ask the parent, so does the baby play soccer? The parent has been trained from the home visit. Not yet. We never say no. Ever. So does the baby eat hard food is a very typical one. Not yet. Does the baby know how to crawl? Not yet. So the children will understand, I don't read, but not yet. Can't do those math problems? Not yet. Can't tie my damn shoes? Not yet. So the sense of possibility, and I don't think any child should ever be considered a means to an end. You know, you keep hearing people talking about we have to do the this in grade two so that they'll be job ready. They are an end in every breath they take. They are an end in the present. There's no one important moment in a child's life. So they're not on a road to something. They are the road. And I think it's how we look. What are the policies we have, you know? Where does the money go? So let me just show you this quick video. So before we put it on, this is Kathy. She's the Roots of Empathy instructor. This is Hannah. She's the mommy. Hannah's baby is Baby May. And of course, we call the, the baby Baby May. Our baby, the children say it's our baby. And um, you can hear 18 questions in a minute and a half. <laughs> and all, most of the questions have no answer. But what we're trying to do in terms of executive function skills, get children to think critically, get them to trust, get them to reflect. You know, you talked about mindfulness. So making a practice in the children's minds that you don't have to spit the answer out, but we do want you to be thinking about it, and we do trust that you can think, and we do respect what you think. You can see the attachment relationship too. Again? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> 
Baby May has a very serious demeanor. So when you look at the temperament trait of mood, there's a continuum. There's Baby May, who's more serious, and I cannot say negative. I, the literature describes it as negative and positive, so I say sunrise and sunset. So she's classic sunset. She didn't really smile until May. <laughs> um, but the ch it gives the children permission to be shy or serious. Everything that happens on that blanket is thrown back to the baby. In terms of the attachment relationship, the little baby spilled <coughs> over the second time. As you said, immediately turns around to mommy, should I be crying or am I good to go? <laughs> mommy says, oh, you're good to go. She turns around and she goes right back to it. In terms of temperament traits, persistence, frustration level, oh my goodness, do teachers not drown in this? You know, the little engine that could is a theme in every classroom that the teachers are trying so hard to give the children the energy to keep going, keep trying. That's why we say not yet. That's why we talk about the relentless efforts to achieve a goal. What is the baby's intention? Well, the baby's intention is to get the darn toy, right? And there are children who are so empathic, they say, please give her the toy. <laughs> they can't bear it. <laughs> so, but we're learning from the little baby. And the fact that the classroom teacher is so much a part of this, but not responsible for yet another curriculum, can reference back to the children. Remember when baby May kept trying? How many times did she try to get that toy? And she fell down twice and she hurt her chin. How do you feel? Do you feel like baby May now? So we set up situations of frustration. We're very cruel. We always hope that the baby will cry sometime, because when the baby will cry, we get to say to the children, Wow, what's mom doing to help the baby calm down? And we go through all the sensory inputs. We're talking about the multiple firing and wiring of capacity, the multiple firing and wiring of emotional regulation. Because if nobody's done that for the baby, the baby will not learn to do that, and the baby will run around your classroom and punching people's lights out in the playground. So it all starts there. So it's quite prophetic to bring how all the children started into the classroom where some are not doing so well and not feeling so happy or hopeful. And it changes the dynamic. So uh, my thing is the developmental health and wealth of nations rests on the breath of the little children. So watch what policies we set. Because they're ready, but we don't seem to be ready for them. So thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm happy to be here.